Hello, this is John DiLiberto, and welcome to Echoes. Today, we are going to be listening to the sound of water running down the drain for 45 minutes. Then we have a Native American drum circle playing with feathers instead of mallets. But first, it's time for... Comic books, a in hell. Comic books, a in hell. Comic books, a burning in hell. Comic books, a burning in hell. Welcome to Comic Books Are Burning to Hell. I'm Tucker Stone. I'm Matt Seneca. We're sitting here in Brooklyn, New York, uh, just uh, hot to trot with our popsicles, ready to talk about comics. Do we have some friends in Pennsylvania? We do. Pennsylvania, the home of uh, local NPR humor. <laughs> I am Joe McCullough. <laughs> I'm Chris Mountner. Uh, that sounds like a good episode. Uh, I, I think, uh, Joe, you happen to know that we're going to be... I, I'm going to throw things over to you quite a bit because I feel like we're kind of like we're playing a little fast and loose. I feel like I'm jumping around without a net tonight. That's where the best material comes from, Tucker. Ah, that's good to hear. Mm. Keep you on your toes. Just so people know this is contemporary, let them know that this is today's and today's and today's. What do you guys think about old Katie Holmes and Tom Cruise? What's the Pennsylvania take? We're all weeping. Yeah. Consecutively. Yeah, but we're ready to welcome her with open arms, you know, just like we did with John and Kate. You know, <laughs> I don't know if anyone even remembers John and Kate at this point, but they live like what, like 20 minutes away or something? They used to. They're not anymore. They, oh. I mean, before they became, before their TV show, I think they were in Mechanicsburg or Mount Joy, somewhere close, real close by actually to where I live. Um, and, and, um, you know, of course we did like big full page stories on them when they were born, when the kids were born. But yeah, yeah, they, they moved to like the Beverly Hills or wherever it is they are now. Have you ever pitched a John and Kate comic to Blue Water? <laughs> no, but now I should. <laughs> I tell you, you know who can be your guest writer on that is Tim O'Neill from, uh, When Will the Hurting Stop? That guy actually, like, he legitimately knows lots of shit about John and Kate. Really? Yeah, yeah, he he would always talk to me about I, I he was my John and Kate like source more than any of the people that I know and I know a lot of people down south in Georgia who watch that television show. <laughs> the question uh, is has he seen the Octomom porn yet? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Christ. Yeah, you know what? I've actually seen I think I saw like a picture of that woman naked. You, but, you, but you didn't watch that. No, 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 but I saw that like that when they were like sending that around on TMZ or whatever. Yeah, that's Gross. pretty that stuff is pretty disturbing. <laughs> I do have to say, Joe, uh, did you happen to see the trailer for Jack Reacher? No, no, I actually haven't seen that. Is that the new that, Tom that's, Cruise that, film? That's with Werner Herzog and Tom Cruise as mortal enemies, right? Yes, and I, you know what, I gotta say, like, when I saw that trailer, it looks like a trailer that's, um, it looks kind of like, it reminded me a little bit of the Dread trailer, where it looks like it's a trailer made out of the few scenes that they've actually finished shooting. Yes. Or Django Unchained. That it wasn't Dread. It was Django Unchained. It was like, yeah, you you guys are still making this movie, and yet you have this trailer already. But that Jack Reacher thing, I felt like I was like, is it? It wouldn't be that out of character for Tom Cruise to release a trailer for a movie that he's in to kind of get some of the buzz that's going on because his wife left him. That could be. That could be. I mean, I don't want hey. to play cynical, but Scientology, they they, they think ahead. You know, oh my god, I actually have a comics tie-in to this, believe it or not. I take think that's away, Take it away. It's time I, to I get think, on a show. I think that's what this podcast is about, but, um, you know, have you ever seen the movie, uh, Incident at Loch Ness with Werner Herzog, the fake documentary? No, I have not, but I've heard about it. Yeah, that, that's a pretty funny movie, and the, uh, the director of that, Zach Penn, is actually doing a comic at Avatar now. That's right, it just came out this week. Yeah, yeah, that's um it it's pretty much a total uh movie pitch comic like I'm very certain I've seen an interview where it's just called a movie pitch comic. Uh I think what I kind of liked about it cuz I read through it and I like that the artist Wait a second. Why did you read through that? I got I just got to know. Not I'm not judging. I'm just curious. Because I am that devout and Avatar Publications junkie. I, I just monitor them so I can have that basis of knowledge for the Avatar Publications retrospective that's going to make me rich and powerful. Oh, man. And <laughs> that's going to be your 20, 23 and a third book. 33 and a third book. <laughs> Absolutely. But um, anyway, this comic, it's, you know, it's a pretty simple thing about a dude who, uh, uh, I, I guess the most 
the greatest thing is there's this superhero in it who's like kind of a rock star superhero, a really huge media savvy uh, superhero who has fans who follows him around his, his, his adventures, and they actually just straight up call him Zenith. Like oh, you know, really? yeah, no, he they, they don't. It's not even an analog or something. They just call him Zenith, exactly like the Grant Morrison uh, Steve Yeo comic. Even though he doesn't look anything like that Zenith, it's just that's that's kind of where. Uh, analogs have gotten her or maybe they seriously haven't even read the grant morrison thing and they just happened on the same idea but i guess what i liked about it was that the artist makes a really concentrated effort to include like not typical white people in his drawings and it's it's so sad we're at that point in superhero comics where that's a really noticeable thing where i'm like oh yeah that guy's asian but um <laughs> But yeah, that's totally what happened when I read that uh, delightful Zach Penn comic. Where it, it's one of those things where he didn't even write the script; he's like code the story. And then a guy whose name I don't even remember from like Dark Wars's Star Wars franchise books is the guy who actually scripted it. But yes, that that's our our deviation into Werner Herzog. You also re- are you a Dan the Unharnable reader as well? I am, but I have not read the most recent one. I think uh, Ferals is actually David Lapham's best work for uh, Avatar at the moment. Uh, just because it's the most misanthropic scene thing in the world, it's just he. It, it's just how men are are horrible brutes and women are ridiculous and werewolves just murder everyone pretty much. And well, it's all a those crime. things are true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is uh, Ferals an ongoing or is that another like? Well, in the in the most recent, the sixth issue, they slap a little box on it that says, you know, end of part one. So I, I think they are planning to do, like, start up part two in a couple months or something. But uh, it's one of those things where they're trying to do it like Hellboy, where they just build in the hiatuses. Or and crossed. Then, yeah, or crossed. And, you know, if they don't uh, make the money, then they'll just stop it right there. What is the deal with David Lapham anyway? I don't know what his deal is. I, I remember back in the day, he was with Stray Bullets. He was just the hottest, hottest, hottest thing uh, ever. Yeah. He was he was one of those, I call them the five guys, because there's uh, if you have someone who reads basically nothing but superheroes, but fancies themselves an indie comics fan, there'll always be five guys from indie comics whose work they'll read, and it's always like the same guys all yeah. the time. Like uh, like Eric Powell from The Goon is like one of those guys right now. And back in the day, David Lapham was one of those guys. Yeah. And uh, yeah. now he's just doing kind of kind of crazy Avatar blood comics that I generally sort of enjoy. Uh, and some Marvel stuff that I think you sort of enjoy, Tucker. Yeah, I actually, I, I found myself reading Age of Apocalypse again. I'd read the first couple and kind of didn't care, but I came back and read the most recent. And I was like, and it's just another one of those outlier weird comics where it's like, yeah, this, this doesn't matter. So, and it ends up being kind of engaging because of that. Yeah. I don't know. It's just kind of old. It's also old school kind of comics where they're like, because they don't, they can't expect you to know who everybody is. Everybody has to like say their name constantly and kind of introduce who they are and what they do in each part of the story. So like, it's, it, it does. I, I think it's purely a nostalgic factor where I'm just kind of reading something that I reminds me of something I would have read when I was uh, 12 or 13 years old. Yeah, but it's also it's it's just kind of an engaging little weird thing that he's doing. But most of the time, I read a David Lapham comic and I just find them to be. Kind of so half-assed, and they're just very, very like the. Uh, I always remember that Modern Warfare Ghost comic that he did. That was just basically like, I'm gonna stop this rapist with some more rape, and then they like open the door, and it's like time. For, it was just like they kept using the word rape over and over again. It was really weird. Hmm. Yeah, I I actually used to think David Lapham was good because the first I read Stray Bullets, and then I assumed that he was just gone after that. Um, but then I read Young Liars, which is. Still one of my favorite comics published in the last decade. I think that series is, like, hugely underrated and really both interesting and, like, affecting. Yeah. But um, but then, so I thought, I was like, David Lapham is good. This dude is, like, an unsung hero. I'm going to follow David Lapham comics. And it lasted me two issues of his next project, which was Sparta USA for Wildstorm, before being like, no, fuck David Lapham. Oh, the football comic with the Colin Farrell tracing. Oh, yeah. uh, so terrible. Yeah. You read, you read uh, Silverfish, a standalone graphic novel he did for Vertigo? Yeah, that's pretty good, too. That's not bad. Anything he draws, I think, is going to be, like is going to be, like, passable to pretty damn good. Isn't that true of a lot of writer artists, though, that the stuff they do that they also draw tends to be better than the stuff they do in collaboration? 
Yeah, but I think with David Lapham especially, it's like he does the stuff you're supposed to do. Like, he works from the grid. He doesn't use photo <laughs> reference. He's got, like, a really nice natural sense of motion and character. Like, he gets it. He gets how to draw comics. And because he draws these, like, low-rent corporate com or writes these, like, low-rent corporate comics, he gets artists, I feel like, most of the time who don't know that stuff, who actually don't have an understanding of how to do a successfully drawn comic. Hmm. Actually, uh, coming up with, uh, pinging off that idea of an artist who uh, is better when they draw their own comics, when they write their own comics, why, why don't we move along to a little, uh, a little foreign material here for some uh, exotica? And I'm talking about uh, Mr. Jacques Tardy, who recently had a new book out from Fanographics, the latest in their now getting rather long line of uh, Jacques Tardy releases, and it's called New York Mon Amour. Uh, it's a collection of four stories that's set in New York City. The uh, largest one is uh, called Cockroach Killer, formerly called Roach Killer, when it was uh, published in 1990 in the pages of Dark Horse's old Euro comics magazine called Cheval Noir, which some of you would like to know is French for Dark Horse. Um... And it's written by a Benjamin Legrand, who is a uh, crime novelist and comics writer in uh, France. I believe he co-wrote uh, Philippe Droulet's most recent book that came out a couple months ago. And it's just about a, a cockroach killer who's uh, an exterminator who's in New York. Um, he gets He accidentally overhears something uh, bad because he goes on to the fantastical 13th floor of a New York City skyscraper, and as I'm sure you and Matt know, Tucker, uh, there are no 13th floors ever anywhere in New York City. Um, but yeah, he goes to the 13th floor, he overhears a bunch of dudes talking about famous people that are getting murdered in their society, and then he runs away, people are following him, he runs in with some uh, Puerto Rican friends of his that uh, keep him captive, basically, in their apartment. There's hallucinations, and he's this German guy whose parents uh, didn't deal with the Nazis back in World War II, but they were kind of just citizens in Germany who went along with everything, and it wasn't until I got to the very end of the uh, book that I realized, oh my god, Tardy's doing another war comic which is exactly what Cockroach Killer is. It's a World War II comic as opposed to a World War I comic, but allegorically, it's all about civilians that are caught up in conflicts that they probably understand, but they really have no control over, and it's about becoming indoctrinated by powerful forces that send them out to kill people that they would never think to kill under any other circumstances. Uh, in that way, it's very, very much of a piece with Tardy's uh, World War I comics, despite the fact that it was the War of the Trenches is something that Tardy wrote himself, and this is written by uh, Benjamin Legrand. Uh, however, I wonder if that sort of content piqued Tardy's interest, if he's the one that found and maybe drew out a little that subtext to this work, which is, you know, otherwise a pretty traditional uh, crime comic with a lot of emphasis on paranoia, urban paranoia, and just old school New York City is hell on earth and nothing's ever going to get better kind of in the subway sort of stuff. Death uh, wishy kind of, uh, death wish New York. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering what you guys uh, thought of this comic. Yeah, especially being since you're situated in New York currently. Yes, yes. Oh, well, I... I, I I actually don't really ha think there's much I could say about it being situated in New York. It it is like it is when I say Death Wish, I'm thinking of the fact that also Death Wish is a movie that doesn't represent a real New York in any way. That it's almost like a a fictional fairy tale land of of horror, you know, where everything like, yeah. there is there is danger around every turn, and and going into the subway is basically like a game of Russian roulette and that sort of thing. And yeah, I, I think that this has that exact same quality of, you know, it's a it's it's a it's a tourist New York, and not not a tourist New York. It's a Kafka New York, where it's like, yeah, you, you're imagining something you don't actually have reference for, which is interesting because it brings me to what I was going to ask you about, uh, Joe, and you too, Chris, because I know you read this as well. But like, what do you think about the the what what's your takeaway when the comic drops away from actual just drawing and it starts being the guy, the cockroach killer, just wandering around in all those pictures, which seem to be all the reference pictures that Tardy was using to draw the city. 
Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. You're talking about the kind of little coda at the end. Yeah, where it just becomes him just like drawing on top of photographs. Yeah, and he's just kind of, it's just the cockroach killer kind of wandering around mm -hmm. the areas. That, yeah, there were obviously the references right down to the very the very end. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was definitely odd. It was definitely, it's definitely kind of an odd sequence. I mean, it certainly stands out um, beyond anything... Um, else in the book. Uh, I think uh, it, it might even be um, the most memorable, you know, the secret's just, just in, it's pure strangeness. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by what, what you make of it. I mean, what, 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 what I got the feeling you had a very specific take no, on I it. I don't, I actually, I, I'm actually kind of turning to you because I don't really, I, I was just confused by that at first when I, and well, I, I will say, actually, that this sequence was not in the Cheval Noir serialization. I'm not even sure if it was included in NBM. I don't know that it was. Yeah. Uh, I don't it, think it was. I have that, and uh, I don't remember that part at all. Yeah, it, it might it, have even been added later. You'll notice that um, the sequence before it where this is a spot color thing where it's black and white, but the guy's uniform is red, and uh, at the end of the story, there's even a Thin at the end of the story, uh, yeah, yeah. the photos start up where everything has suddenly turned red, and that's actually copied from, I believe, the very first uh, page of the book. Um, it's actually the very same panels, only printed in reverse, and now they're uh, red to remark on the cockroach killer's uh, state of mind, how he's just become completely enveloped in this... Uh, you know, violence he's been indoctrinated into, and it, it's not even something that's going to punish him. He gets away from the police having murdered people, and it's it's just something he's going to live with now. And, you know, it's like Taxi Driver. Maybe he'll yeah. go crazy again, and yeah. maybe not. But, yeah, the uh, I mean, the photos at the end of the book, it's kind of... <laughs> it, it's kind of almost almost the fiction beginning to collapse and he's just seeing the world as like super real now. Like he's, I mean, he's still drawn, so he's no longer even part of the world. It's not even the same hand that's creating him in the world. So maybe it's a really intense expression of his dissociation from everything. But I'm kind of wondering if he's just, uh, just seeing the world in a different way now, like maybe detached or as, an alien place on which he can only sort of exist. Well, I think it. I think it's significant that a lot of the sequences are not all. There are some people walking around, but they're mainly devoid of people. Mm -hmm. That he's mainly the only character wandering around in almost like an empty urban landscape. Um, I mean, there's that one sequence in the second panel where he's, you know, it's a, a New York City street K. I think there's one person far off in the distance, but it's pretty much him. I mean, there's a few where he's walking around amongst other people, but for the most part, he's not. A couple thoughts come to mind. I mean, one thing is it might be almost a kind of a rebuttal about what we were saying before about this kind of fantasy New York, that here is this kind of fantastic character who comes from this kind of imaginary New York ensconced in the actual real um, New York. Um, and, you know, in the kind of world of New York City. Um, I think, I think there's also kind of that idea of, yeah, the kind of his world, sh his perspective and his world shift having been changed after having this kind of horrific adventure. Um, you know, um, there's something, it, there's definitely something going on of kind of a fictional character kind of bleeding into the real world. Um, and, and it's it's significant to some extent that the um that maybe that that world is empty and to kind of devoid of um entity i mean he's he's wandering around going back to these neighborhoods looking for people um and he can't find anybody that he knows um and you know so there there could be that um kind of a way of kind of ref maybe felt it was the best way to reflect that kind of empty soullessness that the character feels feels at the moment mm -hmm. um that's just kind of off the top of my head. Um, it's certainly, I mean, I don't, I don't know if Hardy's ever done, certainly not in any of the work that's been published in, in English yet to date has attempted anything like this. Mm -hmm. Matt, have you read this book? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have a couple things to say. I think, I agree that I think him, those, all those empty landscapes are, um, I think they are definitely a considered choice to reflect, yeah, that emptiness and also just the confusion, the lack of having any reliable presence to turn to for help or comfort. Um, like when I like just speaking from my own experience, like I've drawn a ton of shit of like dudes just walking around Los Angeles 
Yeah. Which is so unrealistic. There's always going to be somebody on the street, even like five in the morning in the most desolate area possible. But there's always going to be somebody. But you just, if if they feel like they're alone, you're going to draw them alone. And that's how you do it. So I think realism is sacrificed there um, for a, a specific purpose. And I think it comes off very well. I think he uh, he makes a considered choice there and it works. Um but also, I, I think uh, going off that, I think it's also that sort of choice of uh, doing something that's felt over realistic is kind of a hallmark of Tardy's whole approach. Um, I first heard of Tardy when I read about him in the, uh, I think, vastly underrated Eisner Miller book that came yeah. out, that also came out on Dark Horse, actually. Um, where they're talking about, I think they're talking about, it's this is uh, Will Eisner and Frank Miller just kind of bullshitting. And um, I think it's been way too heavily maligned by all these, like, academic comics criticism assholes who, like, I need their probably. criticism to come with. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know. I don't want to get off into a whole tangent, but I think all the criticism against that book is bullshit. Like, it's not comics criticism. It's the two dudes out of maybe like the top five dudes in the world who know shit about comics. It's two of those guys just talking about comics. Like that's interesting. And if you can't find a point of interest there, you're just not looking. But anyway, um, they talk about Tardy and they both talk about how fundamentally impressionistic he is, which is strange because he's using a pretty clearly Hergé derived clear line throughout, which is just a black line against white space, a uh, very clean, and um, with a with quite a bit of detail, and uh, it very much doesn't look like a painting by, you know, Monet or Seurat or something, with all these like messy brush strokes and sort of blurry abstraction. Everything is pinpoint precise. But at a certain point, with Tardy, you start to notice that he actually is building up more than you're seeing with the lines. Like he'll just draw. He draws so much stuff in all his panels. There'll be like 10 or 15 buildings in all these panels. And he draws all the windows on them. And it's just the illusion of such immense detail that you don't realize that all the windows he's drawn are just little lines. Just drawn up and down that don't actually look like windows. Things like that. Um, and I think it actually, as Impressionism is... Uh, is, is meant to, it actually does mirror the experience of real life of, of, or of seeing with one's own two eyes much more accurately than more realistically detailed comic book art does. Uh -huh. And uh, I think partially because of that, uh, especially Roach Killer, but all his stuff feels really filmic. I think Tardy is the most filmic cartoonist about whom that adjective isn't at all a negative thing. Um, I think he he builds up really naturalistic environments that feel real. He does make extensive use of photo reference as he basically pulls back the curtain on his own use of photo reference at the end of the comic with those photo parts. Yeah. But um, I think it's the best photo reference I've ever seen because he's clearly, he's not tracing, he's not drawing every tiny little detail and doing perfect shadowing. He's just looking at the photos and saying, okay, this is how this looks, so I'm going to draw it like it looks. Um, and it almost has the the natural quality of a life drawing. Uh, however, with the spot color, he does sort of pop the characters out from his backgrounds. Um, in like, we, I feel like every time we do a podcast, I talk about how when the characters and backgrounds don't mesh, it feels non-naturalistic and takes me out of the story. But here, I think it really, really works. You've got this red dude walking around against these drab gray backgrounds, and I think it just works phenomenally well. Um, I think it just looks really good. And the last thing he does, the last artistic trick in this that I would encourage everyone to copy is um, he'll always leave backgrounds blank. Like, he'll do a bunch of buildings in the background and then there's just blank space behind them blank white space Whereas, yeah of course realistically those buildings are going to go back as far as the eye can see but he'll just he'll do like one layer of background and then nothing but then at the top of every panel on the top of that white space there'll just be a strip of gray color to indicate a dark cloudy sky and it just it gives you such uh 
magnificent illusion of very, very deep space. Just this like mechanically layered gray strip at the top. That's just phenomenal to look at. And I was, and then when it goes to night, there's a teeny little black strip on top of the gray strip. It's just so well considered and so beautifully done in every panel that I found that just a constant joy to behold. Yeah. Um, you know, what do you, I'm guessing a bunch of us have read a whole lot of Tardy's stuff, and he's well known for working in a number of different genres. He does a lot of crime comics, uh, a lot of them based off of novels. He's done old school detective comics. He's done uh, war comics. And then he has uh, uh, the Adele series of these very pastiche sort of um, early, late 19th century, early 20th century ripping yarns. Uh, I was wondering if if there's anything anyone found Tardy's style or approach to be particularly effective on? Well, I don't like those Adele books much at all. I think his war stuff, I kind of think the more serious and drab, the better, because his work is really bouncy and has a real energy to it. Um, And I think it's really appealing to see this sort of verve and vivaciousness kind of clang up against heavy topics. Whereas when it's something a little bit more cottony, like the Adele Blanc sex stuff, it, I think it's just uh, it's just not that interesting. See, I really like the Adele Blanc sex stuff. I think that's really um, a hoot. I mean, I really find that really funny. I thought the the I find the Arctic Marauder that kind of kind of parody, kind of kind of winking tongue in cheek parody of kind of early kind of Jules Verne style storytelling to be really hugely entertaining. Um, I really, I really like the Adele as much as I like, well, I shouldn't say as much, but all, you know, as much as, uh, quite as much as I like a lot of, um, most of Tardy's work. Um, I mean, I think Trenches is obviously his finest work that's been published in, on these shores to date, I think. But I think, well, I mean, you still got, I think you still get the same, like as with any great author, you still get the same kind of, um, personality, um, regardless of where, what, um, kind of genre, what kind of take he's coming from, you still get kind of that, that world weary kind of, kind of cynicism and, um, kind of rumpled, um, look and feel regardless of where, where, what kind of world, um, he's drawing or what kind of, um, attitude he's taking. And I think that's what makes him able to kind of move from noir to kind to, to war, to kind of parody, um, so easily. I don't know which uh, detective ones you're talking about, Joe. What, which ones are? Were you talking I'm, about? There? I'm talking about the Nestor Burma stuff. I don't think Fanographics has actually uh, no. published any of it. Um, well, they did publish some of it in uh, Graphic, Graphic Story, Story Monthly, Monthly back in the '90s, and then uh, iBooks, I believe, published another one of those in the early portion of the, the uh, Bloody Streets of Paris. Yeah, in the early portion of the 21st century, before that went under. Those are strange books, particularly. Um, some of them are like really, really traditional detective stories, including I know one of them has uh, the guy actually gathering all the suspects at the end and like naming the culprit and stuff. Um, I'd like to read that. I really I, I would be curious to see him kind of do his take on the kind of schlubby Columbo type character. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I guess fanographics might get to it eventually, not uh, anytime soon. Yeah, but. they've got, I mean, they've got a couple other books they want to get to, but I know it's on their list, maybe for 2014 or so, yeah. um, they'll they'll be having that. Yeah, I tend to uh, like Charlie's crime comics a lot, uh, even though I think it, it's about as applicable a style to a war as it is to crime, uh, I tend to focus a lot on the sort of pliability of his uh, human bodies that he draws. Everybody... And I, I can get what Eisner and Willer are saying as impressionistic, even beyond what uh, Matt has been saying, which I agree with, too. I think just the bodies he draws on people almost not quite a uh, stretch and squash, but sort of they seem molded to affect their sort of uh, emotions a little. They're really cartoon drawing. And I, I just think that seeing um, it, it really underlines the fragility of the human body like when blood shoots out of one of these guys it's just really disgusting and awful it's like yeah, it's like all the beginning of sniper yeah yeah it's like just just putty people being uh being rent through with you know things that aren't meant for their bodies at all uh so i think that gives a lot of edge and a lot of uh energy even to his crime work and his war work that's 
that's kind of the stuff I associate the most with his style. Uh, just in that, that's how I respond best to his style. I guess there's an additional level of distance from the Adele stuff just due to it being in color and kind of looking like more of a adventurous French comic. The sequence in Roach Killer that's like gunplay on a street in the Bronx of just dudes like blowing each other away, pushing each other in front of each other, holding each other in front of each other while they're getting shot, running up and yeah. down the street right. trying to avoid the bullets. That's some of the best, not only is it, I think some of the best cartooning Tardy ever did, but I think that's one of the best specifically gun action sequences in comics. That that just blows me away every time I look at it. Yeah, and if you happen to have... Uh have the Cheval Noir printing to compare with the Fanographics printing, the stuff at the end that takes place at night, the uh, Cheval Noir printing was so dim, you can actually barely make out any of the characters in uncertain pages. Some of them are only, like, represented even by these, like, squibs of blood, like, kind of erupting fluorescently out of the darkness, which is actually kind of a cool effect, I think, even though I know it's actually just shitty printing and Tardy didn't mean that at all, but I, I still rather liked it. Yeah, that does sound great. Yeah. Um, when you're looking at this kind of stuff, though, Joe, don't sometimes you want to read, like, some Masha Jean? I, I, sometimes I want the uh, lighter side of life, Tucker, and as luck would have it, uh, Humanoids has actually released a new book of uh, Masha Jean kind of stuff. It's titled... Right there. It's titled The uh, Singles Theory, and this is a collection of short works that uh, Philippe Dupuy and Charles Berberon uh, put together. They've been doing Monsieur Jean for quite a few years to a good deal of success. Most notably, a bunch of short pieces were published uh, by Drawn and Quarterly, both, I believe, in their old uh, Drawn and Quarterly anthology itself, and later as a book titled get a life uh there was also a companion book called maybe later which is more autobiographical stuff about dupuy and berberon's adventures i think this is actually the first time any of the monsieur jean stuff has been published by anyone other than drawn and quarterly yes and the reason for that is i I presume the reason drawn and quarterly hasn't published much more is because it probably didn't set the uh charts on fire but the reason humanoids has this is because dupuy and berberon were very briefly in charge of a subline within uh les humanoids in france which was dedicated to from uh the way i've heard it basically to copying l'association uh which were putting out a lot of very high profile uh auteur comics, art comics, I guess you'd call it, and they decided to have their own line that would do some of that, and if you remember back, even before the uh, DC Humanoids Alliance in the uh, mid-aughts, uh, occasionally Humanoids would just drop something like, uh, 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 what's that called? Different something, different madness? Different Different ugliness? Yeah, Different Ugliness, Different Madness, or another comic called uh, Like a River, which uh, stood out as just uh, like a sore thumb in that there was these black and white kind of sensitive drama comics, and all of those were from this same line that Dupuy and Berberon were in charge of, and from that same line came the stories that were collected into the singles theory. And actually, this book, if you look at it, is in black and white and blue, much like the Roach Killer was in black and white and red, uh, which is actually a reissue of the book that came from uh, 2011, I believe. And if you track all the Humanoids releases in the United States, it's these days almost generally uh, a translation of something that just recently came out in French. Yeah. Uh, So anyway, going through this, I know we've all looked at this. I I have one kind of question that I'd like to just throw out to the crowd. Does anyone get the impression that Monsieur Jean is kind of a fucking asshole? <laughs> well, I think that's the kind of common criticism about Monsieur Jean, Jean books is that they're kind of very, it's a very kind of bourgeois take on life and that we could then there is that i think that might be a fair criticism to make i mean the the concept of this is jean is uh he's a writer certainly by the point of the stories occurring in this book yes there's a monsieur jean continuity where there's even a continuity note in the front of the book telling you when this stuff takes place but at this point he's a a single uh novelist not the world's most successful novelist but pretty well off living in a nice apartment and he has a friend who's basically freeloading off him with uh his child i believe well it's not actually his child i believe if i if i get can get the chronology correct it's his like 
his ex girlfriend's son, who's basically saddled him off with him. And okay, he, and, yeah. I, and I think he kind of adopts him eventually. Yeah, and Jean has uh, he has a, an ex girlfriend who kind of serves as his fuck buddy for many of the stories, although he's always on the prowl for other ladies, and there's lots of uh, fizzy uh, romantic stuff that happens among these. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, basically, the Monsieur, jo- the Monsieur Joan books are about this guy, you know, this kind of 30-something guy who's kind of living, you know, a kind of very, and very much an enviable life. You know, he's, he's well off enough. He's making a career as a writer. And, you know, he's got, uh, you know, the initial Monsieur Jean stories are about kind of his travails with women and his travails with, um, you know, work and, and, you know, and indignities with friends and family and stuff. And it's kind of like, there is a kind of like, we should all be so lucky, you know, kind of attitude, you know, complaint that, Kind of, kind of makes, and I think by the end of the series, he's pretty much he's he ends up, if not marrying, settling down with you know his ex girlfriend, and they eventually have a daughter, which is what some of the stuff that was serialized and drawn in quarterly, but hasn't been collected yet, um, uh, details. Um, but Can we get into what kind of stuff he writes. He's a novelist, but that that's about as far as I think it ever gets to. We're, ne- I, we're never treated, I don't think, unless maybe a little bit at the, one of the last novels, to what his books um, are actually about or involve. I assume they're drawn there, somewhat from his life. There, there's jokes, actually, in uh, The Singles Theory itself where he's... He's not really inspiring when he's trying to discuss what his books are about. It's like, it's about everyday life, you know, which is sort of what uh, Dupuis and Berberon are also doing their little novel here about. So I think there's a bit of self-reference in that. But just going off what Chris I feel said. Like they actually caught some of that. Like, isn't, there's a pretty extensive discussion with them in, in uh, Comics Journal, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. There's, I, mean, uh, I feel like there's, they actually go into, like, the fact that the, the they... I mean, I'm really, it's, this is years now that I read this article, but I feel like they actually go into, like, how they felt like they, that the character they were describing was kind of bourgeois and was, his kind of, his life was, I don't know, maybe, I, I, you know what, I'm not going to say anything else because I really don't remember what it was I read, but I feel like they actually kind of acknowledged some of that criticism in that interview. Yeah. Yeah, but I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of appeal to the Monsieur Jean stuff, and one of them is, you know, pretty well visible in this uh, the singles theory book, which is that it's very, very nicely cartooned, and it has to be said that both of the artists, both of the authors, are both writers and artists, which mean both of them are laying pen and, on the page and, to draw. And stuff. the way they work is incredible. I mean, though they pretty much, um, I think they just trade off pages. However, it's worked. Like if someone's if someone's penciling a page. They'll pass it to the other to ink and vice versa. You know, they work on kind of, they work on the story on the fly, if I'm not mistaken. And they tend, and they tend to really just kind of just pass around the work as it's being done together in kind of a seat of your pants kind of fashion. Um, I think that the work holds together so well as it does. I mean, is amazing. I, I, they were at, they were actually in the U.S. Um, at SPX. Um, many, many years ago. And I mean, they did a little kind of chalk talk and it was even just watching them kind of do a simple, uh, Monsieur Jean on, on a, on a, you know, large piece of paper was kind of thrilling. Yeah. And the printing of the singles theories is, is very, very nice, particularly when they get into close ups of the characters. Uh, Dupuis and Berberon have a habit of, I think they might actually be expanding, you know, the photography on the pages they've drawn, the panels, but you get these really, like, lush, kind of broken-up lines. You can see how someone's hair is just, like, squiggly lines and how, uh, I think there's whiteout, like, surrounding characters, uh, dialogue or sound effects. It, th- there's times where they really underlie, like, the process behind how these drawings are made that's really, really attractive. It's just a great-looking book. And also, the best of the stories in here, there's one, I think, really, really good story in here about a guy who's stuck in an elevator, and uh, he hears a woman's voice trying to, you know, summon the mechanic to get him out of the elevator, and he comes up with all of these wild fantasies, these, like, you know, little idle flights of fancy about how he's going to run away with this woman and how this has to be the the woman he's going to fall in love with because it's so narratively perfect that they have to hook up. And then she kind of flees with, 
you know, kind of flees from this situation he's trying to express from her, and it ends with him sort of running out of the building once he's free from the uh, elevator, and she's just standing in a park kind of watching him run and look from her, and, you know, her expression is really ambiguous as she just watches him flail as she walks away, and, you know, I, I think there's something universal in that, something rather poetic in that, that I think the best of Duquay and Berberon's mm-hmm. work has to it. I think some of the uh, longer comedy-informed work, like, Jean is stuck at a bad party, or uh, Jean is stuck at his fuck buddy's parents' house, and he doesn't like it. I I think there's there's almost a mean-spiritedness to some of this. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, at, at, in one story, he straight up kills some lady's dog because it's annoying. He accidentally kills it, but the dog is dead, and you know, if you know anyone who's had dogs, that will absolutely destroy <laughs> someone emotionally, and Dupuy and Berberon actually kind of hone in on how sad this old lady has gotten that her annoying fucking dog is missing and probably dead, and you know, so at the end of the story, they even underline it where Jean is telling this story to his editor. And the editor's like, that's completely fucking horrible. And Jean is like, I know, yeah. And it's, I wonder if this isn't the kind of a uh, spritzy bourgeois comics kind of equivalent of uh, Piquito Bellino or something drawing swastikas all over uh, screen printed pages. Just a little would be punk rock stuff from the Monsieur Jean team, you know, challenging your preconceptions. It may be, it may be kind of, kind of they're thumbing their nose at their own creation. Yeah. As it, as it is. Well, what did you guys think of this? Well, I'm going to let Matt tape in because I actually, I actually have a little knowledge of what you're getting ready to face. Um, um, actually hear, hearing you guys talk about this stuff makes me want to lessen the attack a little bit, but I don't like those comics oh, very oh, much. Oh, oh, please, please heighten the attack. No, well, I don't know, man. Like, I just, I can't get down with this shit. It's like, um, it's like, you know that show Girls on TV? Yes, yes. I'm, I am aware of it. I'm, I'm especially annoyed by this kind of storytelling right now, because every time I go out, with a girl, she always wants to talk about that fucking show, and it's yeah. like I just I don't care about the bourgeois life. I just don't. I can't. It's not interesting to me. It's like I think if you're gonna write a story out of all the things, I don't think you should write about that. Um, but and and I do really appreciate. I've actually I was thinking I was reading about something else um, completely independently of Monster Jean that made me think of it. And that's called when they, uh, when you read about like, uh, like Renaissance painting, there was two dominant styles. And, um, one was like really concrete rendering, like all the little details. And, uh, I don't remember what that one was called. It's some Latin word. And then there's one that's, uh, that was called Colore. And that was, the, ended up being the dominant style. That was Titian style. And that's like big, broad strokes with like, Lots of verve, and the idea is to get across the feeling of what's in the painting more than the actual concrete detail. And I think there's, and I, you know, I usually support that. Like I said with Tardy, I think that's what you should do. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, I think there's too much of that in Dupuy and Berberian. I think, uh, I think, um, Tucker is making me lose the plot here entirely, people. Um, I think, I think if you look at, I need it to have some kind of connection to like the human figure and especially to like proportion. And I feel like it's probably a symptom of the fact that these dudes are switching off, um, drawing pages, but I feel like the proportions will just get skewed. They're getting knocked around a little bit. Like when he's walking around a room, like the bookshelf in there will be taller and shorter and like the, the corners of the room will get bigger and smaller and uh and also just figure drawing that has no connection to the human form to me i have i have a really tough time with it because it's just never enough to sell action like when he's running somewhere i don't you don't get any sense of for me like really urgency or uh or speed just because it it's like these it's just these loops and whirls of ink and i feel like that loops and whirls approach and reminding people that it's just lines on a page is important, but it's always, for me, it's always got to be in the context of some, uh, some greater structure. Well, let me ask you this. What what do you make of a New Yorker style, uh, cartooning, which necessarily wouldn't involve uh, a panelization and continuous action? All those New Yorker dudes, my favorite ones are like Louis Williams or, uh, 
or Steinberg, like guys who do have a little bit of actual figuration and a little bit of actual proportion in their work. Um, New Yorker cartoon, it's the same thing. Like I like a lot of New Yorker cartoonists, but it's usually the guys who, uh, who take a more diagrammatic approach to depicting actual reality than the like really like free jazz dudes who are just like really there with a pen and ink kind of slapping it around on the page. Hmm. How about you, Tucker? I haven't read any of these comics. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I thought for the longest time that I had, but I actually, I was thinking of that guy who writes all those comics about Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you saw Rob Ligotti? Uh, yeah, that dude. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that does say quite a lot on its own. However, Tucker, <laughs> <laughs> I I did I did uh, look. I was gonna read the uh, this one, the singles theory, but yes. it was uh, shrink wrapped, and I was like, ah, I don't feel like opening it, so I so yeah. I didn't. I did start reading um Fallen Words though. I di- I unfortunately Fallen Words there for some reason there was a run on Fallen Words and um <laughs> and I hadn't I wasn't like going to pull the trigger like when we got down to our last copy I was going to be like hey asshole <laughs> you no yeah. so I was like yeah so I didn't get a chance to get very far into Fallen Words. I did finish the first two stories which I really enjoyed and I know that was something you wanted to talk about. So why don't we uh Instead well, of we just sit around and make crack jokes about how I haven't read uh, all the French comics in the world. Well, Fallen Words was it was a book I wanted to talk about. I was more more in kind of I wanted to hear what you guys had to say about it to kind of process my own thoughts on it because I'm kind of and this is the new Yoshihiro uh, oh, yeah, Tatsumi I should, I should. from Drawn and Quarterly. It's the yeah. first non like jerk off crimey kind of thing that they've done featuring Tatsumi and I don't mean jerk off in a dismissive sense I mean that there's basically some form of ejaculation in every single one of the Tatsumi (laughs) books published so far the phallic the phallic imagery is at a low on this one well a drifting life I mean that's that's kind of its own thing but go on well I mean I was kind of I was kind of kind of perplexed by this book I mean it's I should, I should, we should establish, I mean, the subheading says eight moral comedies, and that should, should kind of tip you off right away. I think if you're used to Tatsumi, if you're, if you've read Tatsumi before, um, you're, I think you're gonna kind of be flummoxed by this book because it's very, I mean, it's, he's basically doing kind of jokes. This is kind of a joke book. It's done in a very, of a very specific style. A, a type of story he calls, and I'm gonna mispronounce it, Rakugo, um, which translates as fallen words. It's, par- it's apparently a storytelling art form unique to Japanese culture. I didn't know this until I got to the end of the book because all the information about this is at the end, not the beginning. And I didn't read the subhead and I'm starting to read the book and I'm like, why is this so jokey? And but is that that's actually weird. the, but is that end actually the front of the book, Chris? Because this one <laughs> does read backwards. Oh, it's relying uh, that you're going to be an ignorant American and read it like a normal fucking book. <laughs> when I was at, um, I, I saw Tatsumi uh, speak uh, a few years ago, and yeah. uh, it was before it was. I guess they would maybe just got into the second collection. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly the timing, but um, I, I saw him speak at uh, some college, Cooper Union, and uh, in New York. And one thing he talked about was that he was trying to do this thing where he was going to. This is not what Fallen Words is, I believe, but it may be what it became was that his next project that he had already started working on was he wanted to do three to four panel gag strips. That's what he, he didn't call them gag strips, but he called them three to four panel strips. Yeah. That, um, and I, his, it, it was difficult. His kind of, English was really, it was, it was coming, he was talking through a Yon translator. Coma, What's that? Yonkoma, I think is the word for like four panel gag strips. And those are the kind of the strips that run kind of in newspapers. Yeah, yeah, but and he wanted to, what he wanted to do was he wanted to capture an emotion. That's what that's what he kept saying he wanted to do. He wanted to do these three to four. And so that was on my mind when I was reading this because it does have that first story, for example, which is the one I, I most – I read that a couple times because I just I, – I did come away with that same feeling of being perplexed. Um, it's like what – and honestly, it was like what's the point of this? Like I feel – I, I just felt confused by it because it's like, am I supposed to laugh at that end part? I, I don't really get it. And just what, you know, where, where it was all going. Cause it actually reminded me of like a, uh, Yusagi Ojimbo story. 
and okay. I just kept waiting for Yojimbo to show up, you know, <laughs> do because like he was gonna, he's gonna kind of be the active force in a story like that, whereas everybody else kind of does in a Yusagi Yojimbo story. They sit around and they kind of they put on a play, and then Yusagi Yojimbo shows up and turns that play into a story. And, right. uh, whereas this is just a guy who's like, I'm going to, I, I've got, here's this whole trick that I'm going to play on these people. It's how I'm going to get a free hotel room. And then he just keeps the, the conversation going and he ends up buying a lottery ticket. And then it goes off and then it goes into an even weirder place where it's just these dudes talking about like, how <laughs> about he wants to do when they win the lottery. Yeah. And it's, but it's and, like, and then one of the guys just like, it, it, it is one of those things where it's like the first guy's like, I'm going to buy some shoes and I'm going to buy a shirt. I'm going to get some food. The other guy's like, I'm going to go to this town. And then the whores are going to go, like, come inside. Your pockets are full. I know that your pocket, like, his story goes on for so long. And it's, like, it's funny, but it's also, it isn't it isn't tied into any sort of realistic well, this pattern is, of dialogue. It's very strange. And That's yet the funny. whole thing is done in his Gekiga style. He doesn't yeah, exactly. change his style at all for this. And this is this was the confounding thing for me. He does it completely straight as if it were a straight drama, these humorous stories. And it's weird because in some of those later stories, I mean, they end on a kind of punchline where you expect the other person to kind of flop out of the panel and like his shoes to kind of go, uh, you know, go out um, and, and, and flop sweat to appear. I mean, there, there's, there's like, I think one of the stories, uh, I don't know if it's the one you read with the, um, did you read the one about the painter who paints the birds on the uh, panel? Oh no! I I started to, but no. I, I mean that yeah, that yeah. really ends with a bad pun, oh. and 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 then that that's the, and and it's the and it's like the joke, and he sets up the joke in the beginning, trying to explain the pun, and then and then there's like one well, you can you can almost hear the sad trombone music at the the you know the kind of wah 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 at the end. A friend, it's true for a lot of these kind of stories, and yet. It doesn't quite work because it's done in this very kind of straight dramatic style. And I can tell he's like really happy with the way he even says, I think at the end, how happy is how these stories came out. And I'm like, but they, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, I can't really vocal. It's, it's even hard for me to vocalize. I, I mean, I had at this, on the one time I'm kind of impressed with his you know, ability to kind of, you know, to, to invest so much time and interest in this time. I think they're set in the Edo period. And, um, you know, the characters and the details and, and spend the time, you know, drawing the story out and detailing and, you know, detailing the characters and the dialogue and everything. And at the same time, I'm kind of like, it, it feels more like an experiment that didn't just quite work. Um, and I was just kind of curious as to what you guys thought because, um, I'm really at a loss to try and, try and almost figure it out, really, even. Well, I haven't read these comics. Like Tucker said, there's a run on fallen words here in Brooklyn. But um, I wonder, Chris, could could they just be lost in translation? Like, I'm thinking specifically of uh, Yuchi Yokoyama. Whenever he gets on an interview, he basically talks about his desire to produce comics that are about nothing and do nothing, but still have a bunch of action in them, which kind of sounds like maybe similar to what these comics are doing. I mean, they sound, just to hear you guys describing them, they sound very Japanese. I, 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 that's another thought that occurred to me, and I was thinking if there was something lost, not being familiar with this type of storytelling that he's talking about, and I, it sounds like a specific type of joke telling in Japan that has its own kind of unique rhythms, and, you know, these are the ways you tell this story, and this is the manner in which you set it up, and this is the manner in which the punchline is delivered. You know, and as such, not being familiar with that, I wonder if something, you know, is lost. Um, you know, even, even knowing, and, and to be fair, you know, the care that Drawn and Quarterly puts into their translations and, and doing this sort of work, um, I wonder if there's, there's something missed here just simply because this isn't a form of storytelling we're familiar with. Well, it just, I, 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 I think Drawn and Quarterly does a great job with those books. Um, I do, I do wonder, like, uh, I think about how the Lone Wolf and Cub books were translated, where they just would go ahead and use words and not even try to translate them. And there'd be like a glossary at the back, and they just said, "Look, you know, there's no way to make this work. There's no way to convert this into an English phrase that you're going to understand." And so they don't even try. Whereas I never really see that happen with. I haven't. I, I didn't look at Fallen Words that closely, but I don't really see that happen with them. Um, Fallen Words with single match with a lot of these like alt comics that I um, Drawn and Curly is bringing over. And I wonder if that's not maybe to its detriment. Is that it? Just it really. I remember there were some pretty heavy criticisms laid at the feet of 
one of the early ones that they put out. Maybe it was Red Colored Elegy. I'm not sure which one it was. Or it's just like, yeah, there's stuff in here that doesn't make sense that kind of needs an explanation. Well, Red Colored Elegy did have a glossary, and I remember really, really appreciating that about was, it. There, maybe it wasn't that one. There was, you know what I'm talking about? I, I do remember that. I, I, yeah. like, in my review of a single match, I criticized them for not offering. I mean, there's really no real beyond a short biography, any kind of um, context. Six, yeah, it was. Yeah, no that's what I'm thinking of. All. Single match. And, and it it was you're kind of it's kind of like here are these stories which are kind of very vague elliptical um enigmatic stories you know dreamlike almost and you know without any kind of i i i i mean it may maybe maybe you don't need them maybe they felt like like we were just going to present these stories as is and you take away the poetry that's there or not or don't um but i do feel like some kind of context when you're talking bring from one culture to another is required and certainly in the case of fallen words i would appreciate it if tatsumi's um until afterward was actually a forward um it would have certainly helped me appreciate the book the first time through they uh they just kind of strike me as shacky dog stories, you know. Yeah, that's I think that's, that's the exact phrase that I would use to describe that first one for sure. They're yeah. all like that. They are all like that. Yeah, it's just you know a a guy who uh, who's a really nice dude, but then he discovers how awesome it is to have sex with prostitutes. So he <laughs> he buys out a prostitute's uh, contract and puts her in a house, but. Then uh, his wife finds out, and both the women wind up dying, and they come back as fire spirits. And uh, he tries to get rid of the fire spirits, and uh, he's lighting like his pipe off of his mistress's flame to get rid of her. And then the the punchline of the story is his wife's flame comes over, and he's like, uh, light, "Light my pipe, will you?" And the flame that is his husband's wife goes, "Hmm, I'm sure my flame wouldn't be good enough." Which is what she said before, yes. like when she was alive. Yes, so it, it, it it's stuff like that, just very rambling kind of things. And again, you can imagine like a uh, like a EC Seeker or someone doing it and having the characters go like goggle-eyed and whoa, you know, yeah. with, the, with the flop sweat. But just 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 moving on from that um, to another story that kind of kind of rolls through its ideas. Uh, Drawn and Quarterly again has the first ever extended length work by Mr. Dan Zetwatch that's called uh, Bird's Eye Bristo. And I was wondering what everybody made of this uh, kind of interesting book. It's actually called, I believe, An Inventions and How-To Book. Uh, that's sort of in the format of a graphic novel, a short, almost European-length graphic album, but it pauses every couple pages really for long activity pages and cutouts and cutaways of things uh all dealing with stuff that happens in this small uh, i believe wisconsin town over the course of one summer where a corporation's trying to a corporation's trying to erect a uh, cell phone tower in the town i was wondering what everyone thought of this kind of ambling uh, little story well i was most reminded of not a comic by this. Okay, I went into this thing thinking about, is Dan Zetwatch going to be able to pull off the thing he does, which is crazy, crazy cutaway drawings that still somehow manage to make sense as sequential cartooning over the length of an entire book. Like, whenever I read one of his comics in, like, say, Kramer Zerga or a little mini comic, it's, like, a lot to take in. And even though I quite enjoy his comics, I'm also sort of always exhausted by the time I'm done, or just like, whew, I got through that one. Um, but I thought that he made a smart choice with this, um, adhering not specifically to the graphic novel format, but more to, do you guys know these books? They're books for little girls that my sister was really into when we were kids, the Amelia series, and it's like this fictional little girl's notebooks that she like fills full of it's like prose writing, but with a ton of drawings on the... There's there's a lot of books out like that out there right now based on the success of the Wimpy Kid series. This is uh, pre-Wimpy Kid. This is okay. like... This is what Wimpy Kid, I think, is going off of. I think American Girl actually like co-published them or something like that. Marissa right. Moss. Marissa Moss is the woman who writes them. And... Even though they were for little girls, I totally used to dig reading them because there was a really weird interplay of... Uh, images and words like it was almost like rebus books where whenever a uh an idea can be expressed via imagery a single picture or maybe two she would do that so like 
she'd be talking about, like, we got this weird matchbook from the restaurant at the beach, and then you would see, like, a drawing of the restaurant and a drawing of the matchbook. And that's kind of how Bird's Eye Bristow is. It's less sequential drawings of, like, people walking across the street and then going to the store as, like, here's a cross-section of the store with a little dude walking into it, and then, like, here's the kind of t-shirts they sell there, and here's, like, a little biography of the woman who runs it with, like, her headshot next to it and stuff like that. And it's just, even though I don't think it really ends up being a real heavyweight narrative that you're like, man, I'm glad I read, you know, that whole thing through. Yeah. Uh, He keeps you off balance and engaged enough just visually and with this constant barrage of different points of interest uh, in the information that he hits you with that you do kind of keep reading the whole time. And I also also liked seeing him just work a three-tier page as much as he does. I think uh, Mm -hmm. it's really a joy to just to watch Dan Zett watch the cartoonist as opposed to Dan Zett watch the the paper architect. I think it's it's cool to see his cartooning a little more. Especially the first... uh... The first couple pages, almost an introductory section of this, it's it's actually some pretty hardcore art comics for a little bit at the very start of it, where the guy's having, like, visions of the cell phone tower and stuff. It's, it almost reminds me of, um, I wonder if it's his friendship with Kevin Huizenga isn't playing into that, because that almost reminded me, parts reminded me of almost of Gloriana mm-hmm. um, a little bit. Um, yeah, where, I, think where, that's definitely, I think that's definitely going to be part of it. Um, I, I love this book. I have to say, um, this is one of my bit favorite books so far, um, of the year. I, I really, really liked everything, uh, this book a lot. Um, I loved how he was able, like, to blend, um, kind of balance his kind of obsession with detail and, and maps and diagrams and explanation and really provide these really, um, you know, kind of accurate, I think, um, I mean, I, I'm assuming accurate of depiction of kind of middle America life, um, I, I mean, circa, I, circa the late nineties. Circa there's, late nineties. There's, there's a dude with a wallet chain in it, which well, is wonderful. But that's the book. <laughs> it's kind of so perfect that the fact that the teenage boy who's got the wallet chain um, has to does his reports using CD ROMs. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I, I just love his portrayal. You know, I loved. I, I felt love to the characters in this book. I love the way the teenage boy is, you know, portrayed as such a hard ass of the band, but you know, he's kind of grossed out by everything, you know, whereas the, the, the little girl who's the, you know, and I should say the, the, the plot such as it is involves, you know, these two, um, these two cousins visiting their uncle, you know, who lives out in the kind of in the middle of nowhere where they're building a giant cell phone tower. And I mean, and I love, I love the little girl who's this kind of tomboyish, you know, typical, typical little girl in the way that so many kind of 12 year old girls are. I love the, um, the, the, the stupid PR, um, chatter of the yeah. cell phone salesman as they put on their little play demonstrating why you need a cell phone tower in their, their hometown. I, you know, the over eager, you know, reverend who's so happy to have the cell phone tower here because it means it might, they might pony up money to, um, you know, to put together his project. And it's, it's not really a, a moral story, uh, like a moral tale or a, a commentary on, you know, capitalism or anything so much as it's just, a bunch of stuff that happens with an almost like mystic denouement. Yeah. It's, uh, it's almost inexplicable in that way, but it's, it's very interesting getting there. Uh, what, what did you make of it quickly, Tucker? Um, real quickly, I, I just, I've always been a fan of, uh, uh what I've seen of his mini comics. I, I don't believe I've seen all of them, but I've always been a big, big fan of that. And I'm, a, I'm, I am a really big fan of the work that he's done, um, on the fact comics. Yeah, I, I I like those a lot. I feel like those don't get a uh, um, enough attention, but then again, they probably do get enough attention because I'm I think probably everybody that sees them does like them and talk about them, but not a lot of people see them or talk about them. Um, and that's his uh, the comics that he and Kevin Izinga do that I believe Ted maybe Ted, Ted May awesome. used to do as well, but now it's just uh, Dan and Kevin. Yeah, where, where it's just their fake trivia comics that they do. Um, fact parader and various other titles that they use from like with the, uh, and uh, I, and I've always I l- always liked the way he does that, and I felt like I was really excited for Bird's Eye because I knew it was going to be the first chance to see a lot of his stuff, and also to see him work in color, which is just not something that he or Kevin do very often, and uh, and I I found Bird's Eye to be less narrative than I expected, um, from the way it had been kind of pitched and. Uh, 
you know, uh, blurbed. I thought it was going to be a little more, more of a story. Whereas, and it is, it is a story, but it's also just, I, I think it, for me, it, the experience of like reading it cover to cover was less enjoyable than it was to just kind of sit there and dive into that weird, like popular mechanics, fetishistic stuff that he does on each page. Yeah. And, it, uh, kind of, it kind of, um, and I, this is, we, we're going to end the show here because it's going to set off every siren that some of our audience has, but it, it reminded me a bit of, uh, you know, Garrison Keillor getting back to NPR. Even, <laughs> okay. Even, even though this is a fucking PRI show, I think, but, uh, a Prairie Home Companion. But anyway, he, he also writes books, Garrison Keillor. He's the host of that show and his very first novel. I don't know if anyone's read it. It's called Lake Wobegon Days. I think it was in the early eighties and it's, kind of amazing to look at it because it's this totally almost totally formless collection of of strange anecdotes surrounding this small uh area in uh the midwest that that just defiantly fails to cohere into like an actual story very much even though there's continuing characters it's more about presenting the idea of a place i i would think if he was a little more british and a little more literary they'd call it a psychogeography but mm. instead it's this this mass of stuff that happens that's i think more there to give you a sense of what it's like to be here and to understand the history of what's going on here and that and zet watches bird's eye bristow reminds me of that quite a lot in that it's it's not as much about what happens to the cell phone tower or the people here as just the the idea of diving into the perceptions of these people and how they understand things to work and how things function in this landscape. And I, I found it very uh, interesting and absorbing, really, in that way, even if it doesn't quite gel as a story. I actually have read Lake Wobegon Days. At yeah. Grandma's house, no less. I oh, swear to God. The perfect forum. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I, I agree with that. I think, uh, and what really uh, ties the books together for me is that both. Uh, that book and Bird's Eye Bristow are really, I think, kind of defiantly Midwestern. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. They couldn't come from anywhere else but the Midwest of America. And I like how that's reflected in the visuals of this book, too. I was initially a little disappointed by how art comics-y this stuff looks, because I've always thought that Zet Watch managed to walk the line between raw art comics, craziness on the page, and kind of a clean cartoon style pretty well. Yeah. But, um... This comic, all right, he draws this thing literally with a ballpoint pen. It's, like, inked with the kind of pen that you'd write down people's phone numbers with and lettered yes. with it, too. And uh, and it's on off-white paper, and all the white space there is just done with whiteout, so you can see, like, the little strokes of whiteout there. You yeah. You can see it just laying there on the page. He whites out words all the time and draws in new words over them when he spells something wrong or decides, you can tell a couple times he decided to use another word. And um, I kind of like how how held together with spit and vinegar it is. Uh, I think it's got, like, it's like this sort of ruralist artifact that uh, that has a nice feel to it, I think, even though I don't think I'm as wild about it as you are, Chris, but... Uh, it's, it's a charming, it's, yeah, charm, I think, is, uh, the yeah. operative word here for me. This book has, like, a great deal of charm. And, uh, that's kind of always been one of the main things I get out of Dan Zet Watch's comics anyway. So, I think it's, yeah, it's pretty satisfying stuff. I'm glad that we find, we ended on something that we all enjoy. You know, it feels like, uh, it feels like the dawn of a new day. Yes. There you go. Well, I'm Tucker Stone. I'm Matt Seneca. I'm Joe McCullough. I'm Chris Mountner. And this has been Comic Books Are Burning in Hell. We hope you catch up with us next time when uh, I reveal uh, what type of disease I have. Comic books, I'm burning in comic books. I'm burning in comic books. I'm burning in hell. Burning in hell.